Hello and welcome to the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more, subscribe on YouTube or wherever it is placed, Spotify, and leave a rating if you enjoy the show or however it might be. On this episode here, we have the author of a very new book, How Economics Can Save the World, Simple Ideas to Solve Our Biggest Problems. My guest today is Professor Eric Engner of Stockholm University in Sweden. He is author and professor of practical philosophy and is a moral philosopher whose research and teaching grapple with the classical philosophical question, how should people live? By exploring issues of well-being, rationality, and social order. Professor Agner, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Aaron. Pleased to be here. I'm glad to have you on. As tends to be the case, I'm in Los Angeles. You are at Stockholm University or in Stockholm uh, in Sweden. How long have you been there? Tell us about your path to there. Tell us about I've, Sweden. I've lived in Sweden for about five years. I grew up not too far from here in Uppsala, just 45 minutes north. But I took a circuitous route, route to get back here. I uh, got uh, my PhDs in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I got a fellowship to go to Pitt for uh, a year. And then I decided I liked it. So I, I stayed there and I ended up getting a degree in economics first and then in philosophy second. I taught in Birmingham, Alabama and in the D.C. area for a number of years. And then I got a position back here and uh, moved back with my Swedish American family a few years back. What was the main idea to go to outside of Sweden and then later to return back motivations on each end? Well, the original idea was to go to Pittsburgh, really. So Pittsburgh has one of the best philosophy departments in the world, and they're specialized in philosophy of science, which is really what I wanted to do at the time. So I was going west to in search of opportunity as, as one does. And then I found that uh, the people there, my colleagues and my teachers, were not just spectacularly good, as I had expected, but also really friendly and, and fun. So I felt like I fit in. Um, I hadn't envisioned myself living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but it turns out to be a great place to live if you're a grad student in particular. And um, I enjoyed it so much. I had trouble like, getting out of graduate school. I was there for almost a decade, <laughs> which I hadn't um, anticipated at all. And um, well, then I got my degree. And if you're a philosopher, it's not like the labor market is like crying out for your services. And so I moved where opportunity was again, and that was in Birmingham, Alabama. So I taught in Birmingham for a couple of years before moving to George Mason University in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. And I, my family, we were all very happy there. Uh, we had, uh, we really enjoyed the intellectual life and the cultural offerings and so on. But in part for family reasons and in part for nostalgia, uh, we decided to move to, to Sweden in the end. The philosophical life is rich here. It's Anglo-oriented. And uh, I have plenty of opportunities to interact with people internationally from my home base in, in Stockholm. I'll say the weather is not uh, what I would want it to be, um, but it's not even the cold that gets to you, it's the darkness. So this time of year, there's very little sunlight. Um, it's wet and, and nasty. And so I have moments when I want to get back to the balmy suburbs of Washington, D.C. More brightness, a little bit more radiance it does cheer it, us up a bit exactly yeah. my experience with sweden the first thing that comes to mind or the only main item that comes to mind is when i was at uc santa barbara there was people i knew that came in from lund university they were students here for a bit before they returned and that's how i knew of swedish individuals at that time yeah that yeah big. that's cool and then what can you tell us about what are the first things that come to mind when you think of stockholm Uppsala? And also, if anything comes to mind on Lund University. When I think about Stockholm, I think about the physical setting. So Stockholm is set on whatever it is, 14 islands connected with bridges and ferry services and so on. So it's a pretty picturesque place with a medieval architecture in the city center and more modern structures surrounding it. Um, the university has a, or sits on like a U.S. style campus a little outside of the city, but it's in the middle of a national park, which makes it sort of scenic, actually, and a pleasant place to go for a walk. I saw an eagle today on my way, on my way here, which is which is cool. 
Uppsala is a tiny little town. It's an old medieval town with an old medieval university, and it's sort of dominated by the university in certain ways. Listeners might associate it with Ingmar Bergman as well. If you've seen his autobiographical movies, they're, they're set in Uppsala because he grew up there. Lund is a town I have not visited more than like once or twice, to be perfectly honest. I don't know it well at all. <laughs> uh, it's not that far from here, but I guess I should explore the south of the country at some point as well. That's cool. Gives us a bit of a setting and description of the region, which is wonderful. I like all the different regions of the earth. There's so much cool out there. Now, to get into your content, we have two main categories here. How do you relate with philosophy? and economics, it appears that maybe more connection with philosophy based on the descriptions, but those two, how do you navigate those two in your thoughts? So I want to begin by saying that philosophy and economics are actually quite close together in many ways, much more so than you might think. So historically, obviously, economics didn't exist as an independent discipline until 200 years ago, which is quite recent if, if you use a philosophical time scale. And economics that grew out of philosophy in, in many ways. The people we associate with economics in the early days, like Adam Smith and David Hume and so on, were professors of philosophy and not professors of, of economics when there were no such things yet. And then many of the topics that people um, work on are the same or very closely related. So philosophers are centrally interested in things like welfare and well-being, what makes for a life well-lived, what makes for you know, welfare, well-being, what sort of societies are conducive to human flourishing. And those are also, not coincidentally, central questions for economics. The language is a little different and the approach is a little different, obviously. The data are more numerous. But in certain ways, the core mission of modern economics is very similar to the core mission of philosophy. And then, and this might surprise some people, the methods that people use tend to be quite similar. So philosophers like logic and formal modeling and so on, and so do economists. In fact, when I started graduate school in, in economics, I had done exactly zero economics, but I felt like I was as well prepared for graduate studies as my colleagues who had gone to great US schools for economics. And the reason is that when you study economics at a higher level, it's to a very great extent formal in nature. It's proofs and axioms and theorems and things that I could handle quite fluently given my background in philosophy, but that some of the e economists struggle with. And then things like decision theory and game theory and social choice theory, public choice theory, all sorts of formal frameworks that economists use are also in use in, in philosophy. And so you might think of these two disciplines as like radically distinct. One is a social science, like the hardest social science or whatever, and the other is part of the humanities, which people tend to think of as, as soft, right? But they're really very similar. And so I found the transition from the one to the other was not as, as weird as it might have been. And the, the thought of like moving from the one community to the other is not as far-fetched as it, as it could be. So it, it turns out to be quite possible to combine these things. It's also true that in academia, we have more interdisciplinary programs now that combine study in the two disciplines. So PPE programs have been popular in the UK literally for 100 years. And starting maybe 15, 20 years ago or something, they came to the US and, and in a big way. And so across the US now and also across Europe, there are programs you can, degrees you can get at an undergraduate level that combine study in, in the two discipline, disciplines with political science as well. And that turns out to be a sort of winning combination in, in many ways. And so in my work, in my teaching, and in my research, I can combine these different ideas in, in interesting and, I think, productive ways. I'll say 
part of why this is appealing to me is that there are so many bright economists out there, right? And there are so many amazing philosophers out there. If you have to compete on their home turf with these people, it's it's very, very hard because there's so many, you know, even unemployed philosophers are like so bright and so uh, uh, well-educated and so on. But in the intersection between the disciplines, there aren't that many people operating. And so to the extent that I've had success in the profession, I suspect it's because I've succeeded in like stealing ideas from the one discipline and presenting them in a palatable way to the other and and so on. And um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of, sort of low-hanging fruit. And if it sounds forced, you know, think about some of the things that economists worry about and some of the things that, you know, the general population worries about. So things like inequality, right? It's been on, on the agenda since I don't know how long. It keeps coming back, right? And it's a concern because in lots of ways inequality is rising. There's this fear that it has like really negative consequences. And so it's something that the economists are working on. But throughout this discussion, even if you're talking to very strict disciplinary economists, they're interested not just in the facts, you know, how large is the inequality, is it growing, shrinking, whatever, but also in the normative questions underlying it. Is inequality bad? Is it sometimes bad? What makes it bad if it's bad? Under what circumstances should we be concerned about it? Under what circumstances should we, you know, be fine with it or even celebrate it? If inequality rises because some people are getting richer while nobody is getting poorer, is that something we should worry about? And if so, why? And these are core philosophical questions that philosophers have dealt with since, I don't know, 2,500 years or something in the uh, Western tradition alone. And so it's pretty obvious when you start thinking about it that the the central questions of inequality that occupy people have descriptive components. They have components that have to do, you know, that can be answered in a purely scientific sort of way. But they also have normative elements, sort of underlying questions about a good society and welfare and justice and um, fairness and so on that are addressed by means of a philosophical approach. And once you see that, I think it's pretty obvious that you have to address them together somehow, right? The big questions are multidisciplinary in nature. They're multifaceted and they can't be settled from one narrow disciplinary direction. You have to sort of attack them from all directions at once. And now I'm not saying everyone should be everything at all times, right? That's clearly not feasible, but you know, some of us should probably spend a little more time reading outside of our discipline. And um, we should probably also, in many cases, organize ourselves in more interdisciplinary research groups. There's no reason you can't have a research group consisting of philosophers and economists and psychologists and so on. And you're seeing groups like this pop up, I think, with increasing frequency these days, precisely because like, I'd be willing to say that every major problem has multiple dimensions, uh, that no major problem can be addressed from a single disciplinary perspective um, as helpfully as it, as it should. You know, think about poverty, climate change, happiness, right? All these things have descriptive normative components. They have economic aspects, they have political aspects, they have philosophical, they raise philosophical questions. And so it's it's a good thing to me that there are people who attack these problems in an interdisciplinary way. This concept is quite important to me. Places like the Santa Fe Institute, where they combine physicists and a chemist and an evolutionary biologist and an economist and a philosopher and maybe an engineer. And suddenly the things that you thought were just in your category to solve actually reaching out over there took care of something that you wouldn't have done in your category. There was no solution really, but you needed to include that. And yeah, you exactly. That, and I feel like limited. people are reinventing the wheel a lot. You know, an economist start thinking about crime and might not appreciate that somebody in another discipline has spent a ton of time already thinking about that. And the other way around, to be honest, like sometimes philosophers speculate about things that sociologists or psychologists or political scientists have already studied in a stringent sort of way. And it's easy to see how this happens. And the reason why it happens is that we're organized 
in these silos, right? We're, we're organized in departments where people don't talk that much to each other. The incentive structure is such that you have to impress your colleagues in your department in order to get promoted and, and so on. And so people will do things that impress on their colleagues rather than the sociologists across the way or the historians next door or whatever. It's very relevant and it makes me think of redundancy that may exist even though this is a chemist and this is a I don't know accountant who knows uh, different categories of skill um, they might be tackling some of the same underlying issues and thinking oh no it's only in our field that we can handle this while the other person maybe 80 percent is overlap and that redundancy is a real loss but if they combine their forces then Maybe they'll realize, oh, I already took care of half of what you need. You took right. care of half of what I need. And I guess everyone is overestimating their own discipline, right? Everybody has a tendency to think that what they're doing is unusually interesting and valuable, and that might cause them to downplay what the colleagues next door are doing. And what they're doing might seem weird because they're using a different language and a different disciplinary matrix. But if you acquaint yourself with it, there might be a lot more there than meets the eye. I like this broader perspective. I highly connect with it. And I think a lot of issues would nearly take care of themselves if more of this broad perspective was put out there. It's not even so much that you need to tackle. There's something about life where you're the more effort, even our brains do it, where the more effort you're putting in, actually it's like and against your brain's nature. But the things you do on autopilot or automatically or smoothly, they way, way more gets done in a short period of time. You shouldn't be, life shouldn't be a frictionful item. Yeah. It should be a smoothly happening. And so a broader perspective, while some would say, oh, that's not so practical, you need to get down here. But staying down here is the whole reason that some issues remain. Whereas if you look at it from above, oh, these were minor, this is a bigger issue that passes on to that and everybody can resolve things. Yeah. And now I feel like I have to add that specialization of labor matters, right? Division of labor and specialization are good things, right? Everyone can't do everything. You can't have everyone being trying to be a jack of all trades. But in order for division of labor to work, to deliver the goods, as it were, you have to have intellectual exchange. You have to have a forum where insights from one discipline sort of migrate to another one. And that's going to require one that we talk to each other right across disciplinary boundaries and it's going to require that we speak each other's language it, it requires philosophers to learn how economists and sociologists address things of common concern and the other way around like of course every discipline has its lingo and its little shortcuts and assumptions and whatever and sometimes it takes effort to figure out what they're on about and um, in so many cases we I think we see people lacking in that. It's easy to make fun of another discipline because of the way they approach things. Um, sometimes the other discipline deserves some degree of, of ridicule. It might be fair enough, but we have to have a uh, we have to make an earnest effort to understand what's going on in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think scientists and philosophers should spend more time engaging with the arts as well and the other humanities and uh, the world of design and architecture and so on. Because to the extent that we're genuinely interested in building a better world, which, as I said, I think we all are in, in, at some fundamental level, we ought to engage with the disciplines that address aesthetic values as well as the ones that address ethical ones or epistemic ones, the ones that have to do with knowledge and so on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe the way an artist depicts something in their 3D model can help maybe a chemist with some sort of structure. I don't know the exact example, but sometimes it's like, oh, you did that. Wait a minute. Maybe this uh, protein folds in that way, but yeah. you haven't seen it that way. And if you're doing work on happiness, for example, I mean, there's a psychological phenomenon, right? There's something in your head that psychologists can study, but then there are underlying the normative questions that belong to philosophy. Like what's happiness good for? Under what circumstances is it worth pursuing? Under what circumstances is it worth promoting? Is it a good thing or a bad thing if there's inequality of happiness and so on? But then it turns out that, you know, happiness depends to a great extent on the built environment. It depends on things like 
our access to nature and the extent to which we can take a walk in the park and so on. And so if you're genuinely interested in building a better world, you can't just worry about the narrow sort of psychological aspects of the problem. You have to consider what's the environment in which people operate? How does that environment factor into the decisions? Is there anything we can do to the environment that's going to make it easier for people to be happy? And, you know, in that case, is that a good thing? Like these are these are all interconnected, right? And if you want to do them in a ser address them in a serious way, I think taking, you know, recruiting the assistance of people in architecture and so on is going to be really important. It's a key item that when you plan or guide towards the narrow field, you only maybe help the person. It's like a highlight versus they have their full week, a regular Tuesday, a regular Thursday, where the environment and their variables play a much bigger role than, oh, push yourself into this narrow, figure out how to make yourself happy in this context, but you're fighting against the big ocean wave of your reality. That's not a functional way to do things. Yeah, yeah I think there's an analogy in, in medicine as well, and probably in many other disciplines where, of course, if you're an orthopedic surgeon and somebody, you know, a child comes in with a broken arm, you want to fix the broken arm, right? That's a really important skill. But for many medical doctors, you know, doing good by their patients involves like paying attention to what sort of lives they're living, what their values are, what they're trying to attain. Somebody who's a football player or a ballerina might have slightly different expectations and different values, and that might vocation slightly different approach, even from a purely medical perspective. And so you have to have the bigger perspective, I think, even if you think of yourself as a very like down to earth kind of doctor who fixes broken bones, you know? Right. That's true. If you don't include that, now you're just becoming a very, it's like a car looking at a certain element. Okay, looks like the radi radiator has an issue, but maybe there was four other items that are in disrepair that led to that. If you just repair the radiator, well, you'll be back in about a month. Right. And some little problems you can maybe live with, right? Because they don't matter. Other problems have to be fixed stat. And what can be tolerated and what has to be addressed depends on the values of the owner and the people who travel in the car and the goals they're trying to attain. It depends on the law, obviously, and all sorts of other factors that aren't strictly mechanical in nature, but that a car mechanic has to pay attention to in order to be a good car mechanic. And noting, notice I'm not here sort of telling medical doctors and mechanics to worry about things they're not already worried about. I'm just saying, you know, these are things that they're already paying attention to if if they're good at their jobs. And I think something similar applies to, to philosophers, to be fra frank, to the extent that we're want to address questions of, you know, a good life and a world conducive to human flourishing and so on, we're already committed to paying attention to the best available evidence related to those claims and the arguments that we make. Mm -hmm. On the idea of inequality, which is one of the key elements that impacts people's well-being that was brought up earlier, how do you view inequality of the last decade and this upcoming decade and how can economics potentially have an impact on saving the world in that aspect? So inequality is interesting in all sorts of different ways, in part because we have quite a lot of data on, on inequality. I mean, we, we, we know many of the relevant facts about this. Um, however, when you talk about inequality, you really need to specify like what kind of inequality you're talking about. So um, Sweden, where I work, for example, has quite low inequality if you look at income, if you look at post-tax in income, um, post-tax and transfers, meaning you look basically at the number of, of the amount of currency that lands in your bank account at the end of the month. Like if you look at that figure, Sweden is a relatively equal country. However, if you look at wealth, the amount of resources you've accumulated over time, Sweden is a relatively unequal country. And so, you know, people here make about the same salaries, but the amount of assets they've accumulated uh, is very different. And um, there are other ways to look at inequality as well. And so whenever you say, 
you know, inequality goes up or down, or this country is more unequal than that, you really have to specify like what kind of inequality you're talking about. And then another thing that's kind of obvious when you think about it, but I'll say it anyway, is that inequality depends on, or the degree of inequality depends on a wide variety of factors. It depends on things like, you know, who's working hard and who's not, right? It depends on certain preconditions, whether they're in place or not. It also dep depends on things like genetics, right? Which means that it depends on luck for all you know, right? Or for all your concern, the genes that you were born with are were out of your hands and you didn't <laughs> you didn't do anything to, to, to get them, right? Uh, as far as I know. Um, and uh, people might have very different feelings about inequality depending on what the root is. Like if it's like straight up discrimination because somebody's family was enslaved for a hundred years, then you know you might feel that the inequality is unjust and ought to be reduced. But if it's like pure effort, because you, Arma, work so much harder than I do, and I sleep all morning and whatever, then people might feel like, well, it's okay if you make more money than, than I do. So we have to look at what variable we're interested in. We have to consider that, and we have to pay attention to the origins of, of inequality. And these are, to some extent, sort of um, descriptive questions, right? But then you can also ask, like why why is or would be why would inequality be bad and this is the sort of question that we address by looking at political philosophy like there are a number of theories out there and as it happens like most theories most live theories in political philosophy do not say that inequality is always bad so some people are utilitarians they think that what matters is the total amount of welfare or well-being in the world and that can cut both ways so if the marginal utility of money is diminishing like if rich people get less happiness or whatever from their their last dollar than a poor person does then that could be an argument for increasing equality for taking from the rich and giving to the poor but there's another argument too that says that if you want people to work hard, invent things, create companies, you know, create value and so on, which, which you do, right? All things equal, then you might have to have a certain degree of inequality or else the inventors won't be able to get any rewards for their inventions and they won't bother to invent things. And so from a utilitarian perspective, it's not always bad to live in an unequal society, but there are some limits to it. And then if you look at other political philosophers or philosophies, there's a, a theory associated with John Rawls, a famous American uh, uh, philosopher, right? He had this idea that what matters is really who the worst off are or how well off the worst off are. Like we should try to organize our society and our system, he believed, to in the way that benefits the worst off the most. What does this mean for inequality? Well, he wasn't necessarily against it, right? As long as inequalities benefit the people who are the worst off, I'm simplifying, right? Um, but to the extent that that's true, then Rawls was okay with inequality. And, um, you know, there are more libertarian approaches that, that focus on things like uh, rights and property rights and freedoms and so on, who don't really care about inequality as such. But even they have some reason to care about inequality. So one thing that might happen in an unequal society is that the rich can buy off the politicians and the police force and so on, and thereby gain undue benefits. Uh, maybe that will allow them to oppress the people at the bottom of the in income distribution. And then, in a different way, even the libertarian has to care about inequality, right? We can't have a, a society in which the more affluent are allowed to, you know, oppress the less affluent, right? So uh, no matter like how you or which major political philosophy you look at, none of them says that inequality is always bad. But all of them give you some reason to pay attention to inequality. So we have some grounds for being mindful of inequality and how it develops over time, and some reason to be mindful of the negative consequences that might come with that. 
So for example, if rich people can just like steal public land and there's nobody there to like, keep them in check, then right, then we have a problem, right? Um, and almost everyone I think would would agree on that. So inequality is interesting because the, the facts are not trivial and the normative aspects are not trivial either. Like, many of the discussions about inequality are premised on either the assumption that inequality is, is always bad or else that it's not something we should worry about. But if you look closer, neither one of those views holds up under scrutiny and the real story has got to be considerably more complex. It's not so binary as the one side or the other side. Right. And sort of addressing what kind of inequality we can tolerate and what kind of inequality we should not requires engaging both with the facts, right, the economics of it, and with the political philosophy, the normative reflection. And so this is a wonderful example, really, of the point we were talking about earlier, the value of combining science and philosophy, addressing things from two problems, from two sides at once. Mm -hmm. That's true. Put them together in a way. Is it one item that might be noted is when individuals have uh, more as described and then possibly compound interest and in items like that work in their favor, does economics can economics be used to uh, adjust that in some way, or does that tend to take care of itself at some point? Does it get out of hand if not capped or adjusted in some form? Well, there are, I think what we can say is that there are a couple of different policy levers. So any government has to decide what to tax, right? Assuming you have to have taxes on something, the government has to decide, well, what are we going to tax? And you can tax different things. You can tax income. You can tax, tax it in a flat kind of way. You could have a progressive um, scale. That's all doable. But you can also tax things like uh, property. You can tax capital gains. You can tax all sorts of things. You can tax consumption. And, you know, given that you have to tax something, you have to make choices. And some of these choices are going to have consequences, not just for the total amount of well-being in the world, the, the, the size of the pie, as it were, but also for the distribution of the goods and, and benefits. So if you have an estate tax, for example, it affects the degree to which families can accumulate wealth that sort of sticks around over generations. And I'm, I'm not here to say that we should have an estate tax or not. I'm just pointing out that whether there's an estate tax or not has consequences for inequality downstream, and it's something we, we should pay attention to. We're not completely sort of powerless when it comes to sort of influencing the way that inequality develops over time. We can't completely control it, right? But we're not entirely powerless either. And the decisions that we make are going to have to be, or they really ought to be, grounded both in a proper appreciation for the economics and in some degree of you know, consistent, thoughtful reflection from philosophy. Valid point. I like the managed view of it such that it's reasonable and it's not so on one end or the other, but let's take into account what there is. I think that's the best way to actually get things progressing in the right direction. There's a lot of nice uh, mental views des described in your book. And I think that's I always, my view has always been that that's more important than the, the rest is underneath that because it starts from your peace of mind, taking things uh, in full detail, including people so there's uh, no communication gaps, and then, uh, you know, then using things like math or models to assess if there's an issue that needs to be handled. Yeah. Now, one thing you describe in the book that I thought was interesting is that it may help in saving the world to be more humble in a way as a person. <clears throat> How can that be beneficial? And what qualities of that lend themselves to societal fortune, one might say? Yeah, so humility is a, a theme in the book. And I apply that both at the individual level and at the 
professional level, as it were. I think individuals could stand to be a little more humble in their approach to all sorts of things. And certainly the economics profession could could be a little more humble as well, especially given that we have so much to be humble about, right? I'm um, starting here with research on overconfidence, which in certain ways is like the opposite of, of humility, at least when we're talking about like knowledge and belief and, and so on. And there's a ton of research on that going back not quite 50 years, but you know, several decades anyway. And what the research shows is that all of us are overconfident at least much of the time. So overconfidence is pervasive. There's some situations where people tend not to be overconfident. And it's in situations where you're dealing with something extremely simple, like if I ask you about your name or something, you know, you'll, you'll be suitably, Armin, you'll be suitably confident. Um, so that's fine. Um, however, when the difficulty of the problem goes up, we become more and more overconfident. And if you're talking about very difficult things like predicting the stock market or predicting what's going to happen in the Russia-Ukraine conflict or something, people are often like wildly overconfident. Moreover, the degree of overconfidence or the overconfidence that people exhibit tends to be sort of resilient. You might think that you could reduce it by means of simple interventions like you know, telling people that they might be overconfident or telling them about the research on overconfidence or whatever. But that turns out to be largely useless. So if I'm overconfident and you come to me and you tell me I'm likely to be overconfident, that's not going to make any difference to my degree. I'm not going to adjust my confidence because you tell me so, right? And that makes sense at some level. If I'm already confident, like another guy telling me not to be so confident is not going to have any 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 real effect. And moreover, what the research shows is that the consequences of overconfidence can be quite severe. In fact, Don Moore, who's a former colleague who literally wrote the book on overconfidence, he calls overconfidence the mother of all biases because it is so common, it's so pervasive. And moreover, it makes the effects of all the other biases so much more powerful and harmful. So if I'm overconfident uh, or if, I, if I'm really bad at like driving a car, for example, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? As, as long as I'm aware of the fact that I'm a bad driver, it doesn't need to have any negative consequences. I'll hand the keys to you, Armin, and you'll drive to wherever we're going, right? Yeah. Um, the problem is that if I'm bad at something, but I'm also overconfident, well, then we have a problem, right? Because then I will suck at the task, but I'll think that I'm really good at it. And that's like the worst case scenario, right? And what Moore argues in his book is that a wide range of like big disasters, the sort of thing that comes to mind when you think about disasters can be understood at least in part as a consequence of overconfidence. So massive financial crises, for example, you know, uh, Bitcoin collapses, um, warfare, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, I'm sort of guessing now, but you could sort of imagine that Putin was overconfident when he started the war in Ukraine, right? When when he attacked, he probably thought he could cruise to victory, and obviously that was that was not true. Um, and if he had known, maybe he wouldn't have been, you know, so tempted to to go ahead, right, with the with the attack. And so overconfidence can be understood as being implicated. It's not the whole story, but it's implicated in the many of the bad things that, that happen in the world. And if we could figure out ways to modulate our overconfidence, to reduce it a little bit, that might be good for us individually, and it might be good for the world. And it turns out that there are a couple of things that have been proven effective at reducing overconfidence. And just two things that I think are, are important. One is to have uh, data, to confront your predictions with evidence, to make sure to go out there and check were you right in the past or not. Because if you have data that's like unassailable, that show unambiguously that you were wrong, well, then it's harder to insist in your overconfidence. The other thing you can do, and this is kind of cool, I think, is to reflect on reasons that you might be wrong. So just asking people to reflect on reasons why they might be wrong 
seems to help them to get a more appropriate level, to develop a more appropriate level of, of overconfidence. And the story is something like this. Like in our ordinary day-to-day -day life, we're constantly challenged to provide reasons why we're wrong. Even if you're in a coffee shop and you say something, right? I might ask, well, what makes you say so? Or what basis do you have for saying that? And so anticipating situations where we're going to have to back our beliefs up, we tend to mentally prepare ourselves. We back up our claims with reasons to think that we're right. And when we spend so much time thinking about that, we end up exaggerating the probability that we are right. Because, you know, I have 10 reasons in my head why I'm right. right? And that might make me feel like, you know, odds are 10 to 1 that I'm right. But that's a fallacy. Because if you think more about the reasons why you might be wrong, you will see that there are all sorts of scenarios, there are all sorts of cases where your prediction will not turn out to be true. And that helps people on the average, right, to reduce their overconfidence a little bit. So one thing that's cool about this is that social scientists, behavioral economists have identified, you know, one of the driving factors underlying many of the bad things that people do. And they've come up with sort of simple, actionable advice that we can implement ourselves, right? Starting starting now, <laughs> uh, you know, to 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 help. Right. The advice isn't going to it's no like magic wand or silver bullet or whatever. Right. It's not going to work on its own. But if we take to heart the value of considering reasons why we might be wrong, we could use that information in our daily lives. So if you're a manager, for example, you have a team, you probably want to make sure your team is not ridiculously overconfident. Right. How might you make that happen? Well, you can you can ask people for reasons why they might be wrong, but you could also model that kind of behavior. You can yourself admit that there are reasons you might be wrong. You might ad yourself admit that um, there are scenarios you haven't thought about and so on. Um, so there are, are things you can do at the individual level, but also at the level of corporate or organizational culture that might help establish a, a, a local culture that's less conducive to overconfidence. You might not be able to eliminate it completely, but the science provides you with some very clear, I think, actionable advice that you can implement like now. And that's free in many cases, like the idea of considering reasons why you might be wrong. Now, I, I'm saying this, why might I be wrong? Well, <laughs> the I'm generalizing from a, a relatively limited body of research. As I said, it's been going on for decades, so we have a, a pretty good grasp of, of this, but it's not obviously the case that you can generalize from the research to a real organization. Conditions might matter. Um, you know, the people involved might might matter. Some people might be completely resistant. Some people might be suitably calibrated already and might not need to become any less overconfident. So I don't want to exaggerate the probability that the advice might work, but we nonetheless have, you know, the second best thing after a magic wand, which is, which is advice that's backed up by data and evidence, where the evidence gives us reason to try and reason to think it might work. Two things come to mind from that. One of them is there's a businessman or I don't know what his description is, but Gary Vaynerchuk that talks about trying to put himself out of business is his way of keeping himself sharp. So it's a little bit like, what might I be doing wrong that somebody else is doing? And I want to figure it out before somebody else figures it out, thus keeping myself on the track. And then the other item that comes to mind is that, would you say that it's important to not be overconfident such that the level, um, if you have this overconfidence, you're not connected to a reality like this. So your human instinct is not kicking in like a five-year-old you're off a bit. And then if you're underconfident somehow, you're not going to even try, which is a, a complete loss as well. But when you're at this nice point here where you're just with life, you do your full human ability, there isn't a gap.
thoughts on that yeah no you're right i like what you're doing with your hands there because it's like the match that matters right being underconfident is not good either if you're underconfident then you have abilities that exceed your confidence in them and that is likely going to make you not step up when you could helpfully step up and and make a difference but that scenario is probably quite uncommon the more common scenario is where your confidence is up here and your abilities are here and that's the danger zone, right? That's when you might volunteer to defuse a nuclear bomb or something, even though you really don't know how to. Um, the challenge is to sort of match these two things. And now notice, saying that you should avoid overconfidence is not saying that you should be meek at all times. If you're really good at defusing nuclear bombs, then your confidence should be up here, right? And so the challenge is to sort of match your confidence with your abilities and to surround yourself with people who, who have that feature as well, um, not, you know, finding people who are meek uh, about everything and, and everywhere. I always relate things back to relationships and or dating. And I noticed that that has always been a theme that let's say girls will be interested if you are some level, like basically matching is the ideal is what they're representing. This is, oh no, we are not fond of, a, let's say, an arrogant individual or overconfident because it, what I think I've always thought about they're actually saying is that you're not matching your proper level of where you're at and where you can go. So your potential will be limited. Same thing with here. So both of these are inefficient as compared with when you're at the right spot. Yeah, you definitely want to want to optimize, certainly when it comes to overconfidence. I'll just mention one more thing, which is kind of cool. People have looked at the relationship between confidence and overconfidence. So, you know, whether how confident a person is correlates with how overconfident they are. And as you'd expect, there's a pretty strong correlation. So if you want like a rule of thumb, like how are you going to identify the overconfident people how are you going to identify the charlatans how are you going to identify the people you know who are not as good as they say they are well a good rule of thumb is to look at the confident people and all of the extremely confident people right? and all of us i think know people who are confident about everything they claim to know what the stock market is going to do they claim to don't know what russia is going to do next in ukraine they claim to know you know what the pandemic is going to do what the next pandemic is going to be about and when it's going to strike and this and that and if you're dealing with a person who's expressing themselves with great confidence about a great number of topics that are hard um, that are, don't have the feature like what's your name well then they're overwhelmingly likely to be overconfident and i think this is a sort of nice thing to to keep in mind if if you come across people like that you might want to keep your distance a little bit because they're very likely to be overconfident this relates to the quality that a lot of the best professors or teachers or people guiding you also have the phrase that they use, I don't know, or I'm not sure in certain categories because they're not trying to overreach to every certain thing. Like I have the solution to every potential category they ever made. And then that would relate directly to what you just said. I feel like I made that discovery myself in a teaching context. So I started teaching as a master's student. I was only a couple of years older than the students, in some cases younger. And I, I felt inc intensely inadequate. And I felt like I had to have an answer to every question. And that puts you under pressure, right? It, it might encourage you to sort of make up an answer on the spot, hoping it's right. And every so often you'll say something that turns out to be wildly false, and that's going to undercut your authority, right? That's going to make you come across as a as a crank or you know somebody who doesn't know what what he's talking about. I found over time that it's a lot easier and a lot better to sometimes say, "Well, I I don't know. Uh, let me look into it," or "I don't know. What what do you think?" I appreciate that there's a, a gender and age component to this, so you know what strategy that might have worked for me might not work for everybody else but nonetheless it's a sign of of strength i think to be able to say well i i don't know um and i also get the sense that students kind of appreciate that if you speak with confidence when you know what you're talking about but you're happy to defer to other experts when you don't people get a sense for like when they can trust you and when when they can't a little, by the way, that's a wonderful thing that I like to describe your personal example. That's very informative and 
I'm sure somebody right now somewhere is doing that where they are debating whether to fill in and uh, assume more than they know or is it okay to say I don't know. I'm sure that's happening somewhere right now. And pulling back and saying, okay, that's not exactly my area. Then that gives more regard for the people that are listening to you because they're thinking, okay, they're making these distinctions of where they are at, good at, and not. And then I don't have to do the, because if you don't do that, then you're putting the effort on the listener to now figure out where what you said was the most valuable. Oh, and then the counterpoint, uh, recently chat GPT with its artificial intelligence. One of the items that's been mentioned, at least I've seen in the past couple of weeks is that sometimes people are asking it, the program certain questions where it'll just come up with an answer, even if there's not really an answer because it uses whatever data it has and it says this and it's not exactly actually a real thing. And so because of that, they're going to now have to work on the back end to limit those because that's a bit of overconfidence in the system in a way. Somebody described it as like automated mansplaining or something, right? Almost no matter what you, you give the AI system, you get an extremely confident answer back. And if it needs resource, or it needs sources, it'll just make some sources up, you know, something that looks plausible and serve it up as though it were, you know, God's honest truth or whatever. And yeah, that's not, that's not great if, you know, you're building a space shuttle or um, a good society for that matter. Very true. Now, one key point brought up, happiness brought up earlier, and I've known some individuals that they've spent their whole life just talking about happiness. One person, their, their show was called The Happiness Project, some books on happiness. It's a category that's really looked at in detail because it represents what many people would like at some point. Uh, two things. One, is it something that should be part of an ebb and flow of the week? And then how can happiness be impacted through economics? So happiness is, is another great topic in the intersection of, of philosophy and economics. And first off, if we look at what philosophers are, are saying about it, like philosophers are mainly agreed, I think, that happiness is, in many cases, across the board, all things equal, a good thing. Like if whatever you're doing with your life, whatever, you're also happy about it and, and so on, right? That's, that's a good thing. There's some arguments about what happiness really means, the conditions under which you can have it, but, but by and large, right? It, happiness is, is good. However, philosophers are also by and large agreed that happiness is not the only value you should care about. It's not the only thing that makes for a life well lived. It's not the only thing you should pursue in your own life. And it's not the only thing we should promote by means of public policy and, and so on. Now, I'm not suggesting we should settle hard philosophical questions by taking a vote among professional philosophers or whatever, but it's nonetheless interesting that the profession that's thought about this the hardest for like, you know, 2,500 years straight in the Western tradition alone has landed in you know, some degree of agreement on, on this. And there's a huge gulf between the philosophers working on happiness and at least many of the psychologists and economists who are working on it. So especially in the early days of happiness psychology and happiness economics, it was very common for people to say, well, happiness is the only thing that matters. It's the ultimate goal, or it is, or it should be the ultimate goal for all of your actions. It's like the only thing that governments should care about. And they would often pitch this as in contrast with economic approaches to welfare measurement. So they would say things like, well, for 100 years, economists have said we should maximize GDP, but that's not true. What we need to maximize is happiness or, or something. And that's not true either um, for all sorts of different reasons. Well, uh, w one is that you can care about other people's happiness and not just your own, right? So certainly your own happiness shouldn't be like the, the one and only goal underlying your actions. But even, um, e e even beyond that, there are things in life that matter that aren't happiness or that aren't sort of 
immediately connected to to happiness i like one research stream on children and happiness so if you ask people like in the street um questions like do your kids make you happy are you happy you have kids are you happier now than before you had kids or whatever people will overwhelmingly say yes every so often there's somebody like an author or journalist who confesses that they don't feel as happy about having kids as they had hoped or something and they're like brutally um cut down to size online because you're really not allowed to say that sort of thing but there's a ton of research suggesting that people with kids are less happy than people without kids and there's a bunch of research suggesting that when people spend time with their kids they're enjoying themselves less than when they do many other things this might strike you as like really weird but then if you think about it again like having kids is one extremely costly in the u.s it costs about two million dollars to raise a child to the the you know the age when they go to college and then whatever college costs right you might easily have to add another million to that it's really expensive to raise a child and two it takes a lot of time it's extremely labor intensive to raise a child at least if you're giving them the attention that they need and deserve and and so on right and so because of the cost in time and money if you have a child you're going to have to give up many of the things that previously gave your life joy and meaning and structure and so on whatever it is that you enjoyed before kids chances are you're going to enjoy it a little less or you know you're going to have less of it afterwards right uh, and if you add up like all the positive things you have to abandon when you get a kid it's easier to see that it's not all fun and games right and then there are things like kids keep you up at night so they're screaming at night sometimes they get sick they have ear infections they scream all night and then you have to go work in the morning so sleep deprivation is extremely common especially among parents with with young kids sleep deprivation is awful for a person it affects your mood right it affects your cognitive performance it affects your affective state uh, you get irritable it can cause uh, heart disease and it has all sorts of other sort of somatic effects and so in light of of that right it's not that surprising really that people with kids are a little less happy than people without but so now what are we to say about this if we go with the happiness scholars who say that happiness is the only thing that counts then we have to say something like well having kids is a bad thing for a person you and your partner your family you're worse off when you have kids and that doesn't sit quite right that doesn't feel like a conclusion you want to draw nor do you have to and this is again where the philosophy comes in so um, philosophers don't by and large think that happiness is the one and only thing that counts there are philosophers who believe that but you can find philosophers who believe basically like pick any absurd propositions in proposition there's going to be like some philosopher who believes it right philosophers tend to fall in in two camps these days some of them tend to focus on things like um, desires and preferences like what do you want with your life possibly values like what are the values that you want to promote in life and if you want what you want is having a family and uh, you know be part of the circle of life and you, you know have a big family maybe have grandkids one day and so on well then having kids in fact makes you better off another school of philosophers will say things like there are certain things that are good for a person whether or not those things make the person any happier and whether or not the person wants those things um, and so for example like physical health it's good for you mental health is good for you whether or not like what your values are and people who take this line or who, who push this line very often will say something like well companionship matters having friends makes for a life well lived whether you want them or not whether they make you any happier or not and the same thing is true for having a family so being able to form a family having kids and so on these philosophers will say is good for a person even if they aren't any happier as a result so this is a situation where there's a huge gulf between the scientists and the philosophers on a topic 
that strictly speaking belongs to philosophy, namely, you know, what makes for a life well lived or what's a life of, of well being. And philosophers here have the more sensible answer, I think. They have the more sensible view. Not that they agree, right? They very obviously don't. But the sort of range of views that you get that are live views in the relevant philosophical community all have the feature that they don't put all the weight on happiness in the sense that the economists and psychologists use that term. Two items there that came to my mind are... One, the broader question, is it selfless or selfish to have a child at the current time? And then is part of the reason that there's a reduction across many parts of the planet in that is that the, if it was like a chemical equation, the activation energy is beyond what most are willing to participate in. I'm not sure I understand the activation oh, energy bit. Like the, but... like the cost of the, starting the process and getting it going uh, maybe used to be like a lower hump of like how much difficulty to uh, do it in their minds. And now it looks like so substantial that they are like, I will not take part. You, you mean like the perception of how much effort goes into, goes into mm -hmm. this and whether you're able to like take the negative, accept the costs as, as well as you know, as you enjoy mm -hmm. the benefits. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, is it selfish? Well, I, I don't think so. Maybe I'm the wrong person to ask because I happen to have three kids of, of my own, you know, maybe I'm too defensive to have a clear view of, of this. But if you're worried about things like overpopulation and climate change, like overpopulation does not seem to be as much of a concern as many people historically have thought. Climate change is, in fact, a, a concern. But there are obviously other things that need to be done in order to curb climate change, where having a child more or less is not going to make a, a difference. I want to add that like adopting is wonderful if you're in a position to adopt, like that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, but if we want to spend our time talking about climate change and how to deal with it and so on, chiding people who have kids seems to me a, a destructive a way to go about it. Clearly, we need much more radical interventions than that. And I'd propose we start talking about them rather than attacking individuals for a choice like, like that. Mm -hmm. I notice, I look at sometimes at the graphs of where population is increasing or there's an older generation and not as much young individuals or uh, the most increase, I believe, is in Africa and maybe India, I think, from some of the things I've seen. What, uh, in the next decade, where could the thoughtful resources of the planet go to um, help uh, population go in a manageable direction? Is there any difficulties in the next five, ten years that may come up with some areas being shortchanged and some areas expanding very quickly. So I'm moving outside of my area of expertise now. And so in the spirit of uh, epistemic humility, I feel like I should, I should flag that. Well, so w one thing, um, it seems that economic development has an effect of curbing overpopulation. That seems to be true in many places anyway, you know, as we get richer, uh, rich countries in Europe, for example, have you know, are way below replacement rate. Um, and so, you know, some degree of economic development and stability, anti-poverty action, those are things that we have reason to pursue anyway. And they might have the additional benefit of uh, uh, curbing sort of rapid uh, population growth. The other thing that's got to be part of the piece of the puzzle is migration, right? So there are some very rich countries in Europe, for example, that uh, are way below replacement rate where the population is aging that would really benefit from working age people uh, moving there. And then there are other places with lots of people and few economic opportunities. And we could, there is uh, an intervention, right? There is a legal framework that allows people to move from the place that are very crowded, uh, that where opportunities are scarce, to places with more opportunities where they can also do more good for uh, the population. So migration is going to be 
key to that. Like right now, a few people want to talk about migration as a driver of economic growth and a driver of, of welfare, but um, to a very great extent, the migration is where it's at. That makes sense. Bringing value where it can be or where it is needed. And sometimes maybe a direct switch might be good enough or maybe some from here to here, right? Filling in the gaps. We, we do that very well at, uh, in some cases for uh, human solving problems. That's a nice deal. Now I have two last questions on these topics. One, we brought up uh, poverty a few times. Where is poverty the largest issue? Or separately from that, are we already doing well in that category as far as the bottom end? The people who are doing the worst, is that being tackled well? Or do we have a lot to go? Now I'm a little outside of my area of expertise as well. <laughs> but poverty seems to be going down for all I know. Uh, right, the number of people, the share of the population in extreme poverty is, is going down. So there are some positive signs. Obviously, there are very many very poor people. Um, those people are already poor. They're already not very well off. And they're disproportionately at risk for some of the other things that might happen. They're disproportionately at risk for pandemics, uh, things like that. They're disproportionately at risk for climate change. And so flooding events, for example, might have all sorts of consequences for people and their ability to, um, to have fine food to eat. It might affect um, disease, right? Um, and so clearly more needs to be done um, to curb the poverty that that remains and there's obviously a lot of it one of the things that economists will talk about is simply to give money to to poor people it sounds so easy right it sounds like it's got to be you know it's got to be more to it than that and obviously there is more to it than that but there's a lot of research in economics suggesting that what poor people need more than anything is money money so they can feed themselves and their kids so they can provide themselves with decent housing so that they can start businesses, so that they can move to wherever job opportunities exist, so that they can take care of the elderly, and so on and, and so forth. And so um, donating money to the people most in need seems to be a good way, way to go. And that might seem like, you know, a nutty fringe dream or whatever, but it's an idea that very many economists buy into these days, and I wish more people knew about that. You just reminded me of something quite important that I was thinking about when I was reading your book and I've thought about it for many years. Is there something to the idea that I always think about like a hill and if you're on this side, everything has compound interest and you have more properties and more rental and more all these things, everything's towards you. And then on this end, you're behind on payments and paying more interest and it's like a, things are more difficult. So obviously being on this end is easier. Is there something to the idea that your mindset separate from your, your practical world uh, can help bring you onto this end even before you're onto that end any thoughts on that so i don't know if mindset really is the critical factor to to look at i mean when you when people talk about that it sounds as though everything that's preventing poor people from becoming rich people is like their frame of mind or the way in which they think about the world or something and you know that does not seem to be true but it is true that there is there is something that economists call a poverty trap but which is that once you are poor, it's hard to make yourself non-poor. It's hard to pull yourself up by the bootstrap. It happens, but uh, for many people it doesn't. And uh, part of the story there seems to be sort of cognitive effects of being poor. There's a research stream on scarcity in the sense of the psychological feeling of not having enough. And that feeling, it appears, can cause you to think less clearly, to focus too little on the future, um, to have inappropriate affect, and and so on. And so there's some degree of evidence suggesting that like, if you feel intensely that you don't have enough, that feeling messes with your ability to get yourself out of the situation that you're in. And this is one of the factors that keep poor people poor. And there are economists who have thought about ways in which you can sort of address this. And what they'll say is that like, giving money to poor people is great, 
but uh, well because they can buy things they need like childcare so that they can go get a job or whatever it might be but um, getting money also requires you to spend it wisely and so if you need childcare, you're going to have to go into a market you're going to have to explore all your options you're going to have to hire one you're going to have to check their qualifications you're going to have to monitor their work and whatever and so if there's a way for the government to provide high quality childcare to the working age population that might be a more efficient way to help people out of of poverty because then not only do they get the child care but they can also dedicate their limited cognitive uh, abilities toward the sort of thing they really want to be thinking about which is possibly how to get a job or how to start a business or how best to invest whatever money that you have so just making poor people's lives easier is something that many economists talk about as a critically important intervention and this is like the opposite of what many politicians will suggest right much of the narrative is poor people are lazy they're just not working hard enough we have to make their lives harder less tolerable to encourage them to work and that's getting it entirely backwards it seems because what poor people need is you know an easier way of it an easier way to like get their lives back on track and to pull themselves out of poverty. This might not be what you expect economists to say, right? Depending on what preconceived notions you might have, you might have a vision of economists focusing on the money, you know, privatization, deregulation, you know, punishing poor people and so on. But if you read the actual economists who work on this, I think very often they'll say things like, we have to give poor people money and we have to make their lives easier which is very different from what politicians might be talking about and very different from what the stereotype suggests economists are on about. I relate with the concept because any certain times in my existence when there has been a, a period of difficulty or uh, things out of hand, let's say, or um, too much going on, I would call it hemorrhage. I had this term called hemorrhaging because it was almost like no matter what's uh, in my efforts, it's just things are being lost. Like it's almost out of my hands until certain things are taken care of, then there's no more hemorrhaging. So I kind of, I highly relate with what you're describing there. Yeah, no, I know, I know exactly what you mean. Like I have a little to-do list on my computer. So it's always sort of in the background somewhere. And if it's got a reasonable number of entries on it, I do a pretty good job of taking them off in a work day. Like if there are five of them, I can take them off and feel quite good about myself. Myself. But sometimes I come to the office and the to-do list is just wild. It's like so long it doesn't fit on the screen. And at some point I just become overwhelmed. I, I close it and I get nothing done. And so, you know, the conclusion there, I think, is that there's like an optimum pressure having some degree of pressure right, is good having some degree of encouragement and incentives and so on but if it becomes too much people have a tendency to sort of shut down um, and, and that might matter from a personal point of view but also from a policy point of view there might be things that we can do to make people's lives a little easier to manage and a little less likely to hemorrhage as you put it it's a nice term i might borrow that if you don't mind <laughs> I noticed that trend at times. I was like, this is a period of that. And it, it, from mine, it might have been sometimes maybe, um, like in your example, I see, like I say, time would have been hemorrhaged because it could have been used on things, but it was hemorrhaged. Some, it could be money is being hemorrhaged because maybe you're making purchases, impulse purchases, you wouldn't be doing at that time. Some of the important items that matter to you could be different categories, but they're just drifting away and you can see it, but you can not really do anything in those moments until you have a foundation more it's almost like if a building was on a weak foundation and you had to hold it all day long now you're using your arm muscle that's out of you can't work out this arm muscle now now you only have one hand to work with until the building is set and now it can you can do the rest people in the literature sometimes use uh, um, sort of muscle power as a metaphor like the thought being that you have a certain degree of strength you have a certain amount of power in your arms but if you're overwhelmed then you know or the pressure becomes too high at some point you're not going to have the power to persevere this is it's a, i like that relation right there and also i think of also uh, like prefrontal cortex like our processing power too so those go hand in hand you run out of it it's then... 
obviously yeah. sharply limited. And I'm saying this from my own personal experience as well. <laughs> right. That's funny. My last question for you has a slight two part, but one is, uh, are there any main key figures that come to mind who have guided you on your path to where you are or your views? And then what would you want people to take away from your book? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. When it comes to The Economists, I think there were maybe two people who were three people who were p particularly influential. So uh, when I first decided I was going to take a course in, in economics, I was a PhD student in philosophy. I'd never done any economics before. I just walked over to the econ department in, in Pittsburgh and asked, like, what sort of courses do you have? And there was a course in game theory that looked fun, so I signed up for that. And I was lucky enough to get Al Roth as my first professor. And he was already then very highly regarded as a game theorist and as an experimental economist. But he um, became much more famous after that as a Nobel laureate and um, somebody who's received sort of very many of the uh, awards available in the profession. So he's a, he's a superstar. And he wasn't just like, fantastically good at what he was doing, but he was also really welcoming. He could have waved me off, right, as a silly philosopher uh, uh, who didn't know what I was doing, but he was very encouraging. And I feel like that was a critical juncture where, you know, I could have just turned around and walked right back to the philosophy department, but thanks to him, I, I didn't. I was lucky enough also to work with Christina Bikiri. Al Roth, by the way, appears in the in the book, right? Christina Bikiri does too. She's a philosopher and a game theorist, but she works in the intersection between the two disciplines. And that w was really critical um, for my development. And George Lowenstein is, a, is an economist who doesn't appear as much in the book as he maybe should, but he's a behavioral economist who works on, on a wide range of interesting things. He's an economist, but he's influenced by sort of psychology and cognitive science, and he's attentive to issues of philosophy and, and history, which is part of why we got along so well. And um, he invited me to join him for some projects and, and this and that. So I, I realized that my path it was is extremely contingent on having run into some very charismatic, very competent people at various critical points in time. I could have ended up in a very different, very different place. I'm glad I didn't, I guess. <laughs> and the, or, the second part of the question was like, what's the take home point of the book? Did I, did I remember that correctly? Yeah, so I think yes. the, the central take home point is that economics as a science has things to teach us in our private lives as citizens individuals we go about our business we try to be happy we try to navigate the problems that we run into and so on and economics has a lot to teach us about how to do that but not only that economics also tells us a lot about how to run a good society how to build policy that works that delivers um that that delivers the sort of goods, the sort of values that we that we care about. And I think this matters, and it's important to say because, well, one, we live in sort of an era of generalized science skepticism and fact resistance and, you know, politicians saying they've had it with experts and so on. And um, two, in particular, there are lots of people out there who are skeptical of, of economics. And as I said before, right, economists have, ought, have much to be humble about. Uh, there are economists who deserve to be ridiculed and so on. But if we end up sort of dismissing the entire discipline, as some people do, we've lost out on something that's really valuable, which is an evidence-based way to live better lives and to build a better world. And what I'm hoping, if, if the book accomplishes like one thing, is just to encourage people to be open to the possibility that science has something to tell us. It speaks to us, um, even in this era of rapid change when so many things seem to be radically new economics has insights and there are there's like a, a an underlying sort of optimism there as well which is that there are things that we can do about stuff like many people report being overwhelmed by concern about climate change and if you think about the reality of poverty you might be overwhelmed by that and we ought to pay attention to the reality of these problems but it's also helpful i think to to recognize that there are evidence-based strategies that we can use to make things a little better for people. And if we can, by all means, let's 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 do it. 
I know I said that was the last question, but when you mentioned the game theory, it made me think of one quote that I had uh, shared earlier from your book. And I thought I mentioned it here. And just if you had any feedback on this one here, it was about two people have some two people have some degree of control over what game they're playing. If they don't like the outcome of the game they're actually in, they don't have to play it. They can choose to play another one. The other game can have other Nash equilibria, meaning that it leads to very different outcomes. Does that bring up any thoughts on us as people and how we can play a different oh, game? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's from the chapter on building community and Eleanor Ostrom was the first female Nobel laureate in economics, the Memorial Prize laureate. She points out that there are these interactions that people have that are hugely destructive, where whenever each individual acts rationally and in their interest, the outcome is terrible. It, you might be familiar with the idea of a prisoner's dilemma, right? It's a situation like that. And what she's pointing out is that we're not doomed to living in these sorts of, of, of situations, of experiencing playing these games. We have, as a community, within it is within our power as a community to change the game that we're playing. And her story is one of social institutions. We can build institutions, uh, which are patterns of interactions that govern the way people live together in society, that change the parameters of the game and that change, that convert a destructive situation into a more productive one. And she had a vision of, of a good society as sort of an interlap, interlocked system of institutions operating at different levels, exactly solving problems for people at the proper scale that I think is really compelling. Um, we're not, we, it doesn't have to be whatever we're worried about, right? Climate change, it doesn't have to be that way. There are things that we can do as a community, if not as individuals, to make life better and to live within planetary boundaries and so on. And um, there's a very important message there, I think. Wonderful description. I found it to be very inspirational, that, that part. Some things speak to me more than others, so I like to represent them. I'm glad to hear that, Armin. Thanks for bringing it up. You never want to leave something out. That's one thing I've uh, figured out in life. If you leave it out, you'll be the only one who would have known that you would have left it out. And that's only a loss in total. That's good. That's deep. I like that. I might quote you on that. You are free to quote anything I mentioned. I'm glad to have it uh, put out there. For sure. Or I'm very glad to be. I'm very glad you didn't leave me out of your lineup this uh, this year. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you as well. Where can people find your work, or where would you guide them to? Well, my book is available everywhere where they sell books. I have a website. I am on some social media websites a little more than I should. Twitter, for example, where my handle is Eric Agner, as in my name, no punctuation. Wonderful. Well, Pastor Agner, I would like to thank you for having come on the show and shared with us quite a bit of information and speak about your book. Thank you so much, Armin. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. And we are out.